The ice moved. It moved slowly. One yard, two yards, twenty yards. The long, lonely scream of the white wilderness lasted for pendous roar of freedom circled the earth in thirty hours. Creatures grazing in the primeval coal forests on the far side of the planet raised inquiring nostrils to the reverberating thunder that echoed from the south against the sullen skies. The ice moved. And then stopped. The mountains that reared into the ice cap, with their roots firmly embedded in the jaw of the Earth's mantle, arrested the great slide to the ocean. They were older than the life that stirred on the planet. They had been thrown up in the turmoil that followed the creation. They would not be moved. The searching stresses simmered and weakened. The cycle of tremors that had dealt repeated hammer blows to the planet faded into tranquility. The ice fell silent. The imprisoned mountains, deflected by the remorseless movement, settled to their eternal task of stemming the march of the ice to the sea. The ice was patient. Five million years passed before the ice was ready to renew its challenge to the mountains. <coughs> Sherwood. Mr. Sherwood, Julia Hammond. I've been calling you for five minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, according to the roster, you are tonight's duty officer, and I've got a problem. <laughs> After six months in Antarctica, I fully understand, Miss Hammond, but I warn you, I'm a happily divorced man with peculiar habits. I'm working in the geophysic lab. I think you ought to come and take a look at your electronic seismometer. Why? Well, I know what they look like. Please, Sherwood, I think it's serious. <laughs> a million miles from civilization, and we've had burglars. Please, Sherwood! I was cataloguing some ice core samples when suddenly your seismograph started clicking continuously. This started ten minutes ago? Yes, it's never made as much noise as that before. And look at the VDU. Hmm. The epicenter bears due north, the coast. Well, it could be ice cap crevassing or an iceberg carving. You don't sound convinced, Sherwood. You can call me Glynn. I'm not. Not even the carving of a giant tabular bird could cause that sort of reading. Could it be an ice quake? The ice cap in this region of Antarctica is as stable as a quaker map. <laughs> Let's get some idea of the damage. Mr. Johansen? Yeah, all the hoods are pretty okay, Mr. Brill. The generators come off its piles, but I reckon to have that checked up today. And number two diesel tank? <coughs> Looked in a bad way. Yeah, split. <coughs> uh, but near the top. Only about oh, 500 litres lost. It tanks off a cradle, but she's okay. We've enough oil for the generators to last us until July. Yeah, no problem, if we're careful. Ah, thank you, Mr. Johansen. Stevens? Nothing disastrous. Uh, smashed signal generator. All the radio gear is okay. <laughs> uh, no more films, though. The television monitor fell on the video recorder. Oh, well, we'll see if we can stretch our budget to cover research into reviving the art of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, it looks like we've come through an ice quake relatively unscathed. Mr. Brill? Miss Hammond? All my samples were lost, and I, I don't have even a single test tube left. How long will a relief supply flight take to get here? Have you any idea how much it costs the Rosenthal Foundation to charter a Hercules from the Royal New Zealand Air Force? Anyway, the airstrip is unusable at this time of year. Why not contact the American South Pole base? Wouldn't they provide an airdrop? If it was a matter of life or death, I wouldn't hesitate to ask them, but I have no intention of prevailing on their generosity just to keep us in test tubes. <gasps> And this was taken on Polarsat's orbit 1051 about um, 36 hours ago. I'm sorry, there's been a lot of cloud cover recently. Oh, thanks, Jim. Hmm. 
Looks pretty good. What's the scale of these pictures? Uh, about 100 kilometres to the centimetre. You can just make out the coastline. Huh? Mm. On the high-res pics, when there's no cloud cover, you can even see this base. Yeah. Fine. Um, Julia, pass that Polosat pic, will you? Uh, no, the, uh, the one that was taken ten months ago. This one? Yeah, that's him. Jim, we've got a pair of dividers so I can scale these distances. Yeah, sure. Okay. I make this bay roughly 180 miles across by mm, 90 miles deep. So? So, it's a new bay. What? 300 miles north of a smack on the epicenter of our icequake is about 7,000 square miles of coastal bay that wasn't there nine months ago. For God's sake, see reason, Sherwood. The coastline of Antarctica is changing all the time. Icebergs are being carved continuously. Not here. The entire region's been stable ever since the first survey by the Scott Polar Institute back in the 30s. Seismograph records and recent satellite pictures show the ice cap to be stable. There's hardly been any significant iceberg carving along the entire section of coast. And you think the ice quake was due to the sudden carving of a whole mass of icebergs? Yes. Okay, so where are they? They don't show up on these latest Polisat covers. That's exactly why I want to survey the area. Our job is to survey Antarctica by the most economical means possible. The Polisat satellite can be used for the sort of work you have in mind for a thousandth of the cost of an expedition. There might not be a break in the cloud cover for weeks, months. We can't afford the fuel. There's plenty of diesel for the snowcat I've checked. Look, I don't care how many there are, we are not interested in icebergs. I'm not sure I don't agree with Brill, Sherwood. Hmm? Is it so important? Hang on. Ah. <laughs> oh, well, well, I can't think of many things that are more important than the stability of the Antarctic ice cap. And please, call me Glenn. What? Ice is only important to the whalers, Sherwood. You know, back home in Norway, work the factory ships, we curse the stuff. <laughs> Shot. The stability of the Antarctic ice cap concerns every man, woman and child on this planet. It contains 90% of the Earth's fresh water. Were it not for the ice cap, mean sea levels throughout the world would be 20 metres higher than they are now. Shh. All I need is a double two. Huh. Got well, it. Yeah, <laughs> That's me out. <sighs> You're over-dramatising, Sherwood. A massive carving of icebergs doesn't mean the cap's about to melt. Oh, well, maybe not. Thanks. But if a section that's been stable for millions of years, probably since the Cretaceous period, has suddenly shed a mass of icebergs, I want to know why. You're the geologist. Could it happen again? Oh, damn. That's what frightens me. Okay, so we take a look. Eh, hey, Sherwood? Eh? Hey? We take a snow cat. Take a look. I'll say I'm taking the cat out to test her new grouses. She's already loaded with drums of extra fuel. Take you two along as extra weight. So. Going's good. Might be different next week. We'd be shot. We've all been here for our two years, so the Foundation won't be renewing our contracts anyway. Oh, well done. Oh, <laughs> Both of you are. Fancy a trip to the beach, Miss Julia, so I can have my wicked wheel here under the merciless tropical sun? I'll pack my suntan oil, Sherwood. <laughs> I do wish you'd call me Glynn. You lose, Sherwood. Marvellous going, Oath. Turn the heating down, it's stifling. I just drilled in this area when I first came out here. The ice cap's as stable as the rock of Gibraltar, but we'll have to ease up when we're near the coast. Why is that? Well, I don't know what the coastal ice fields are like, and uh, if there has been a massive iceberg carving, what's left of the field might be unstable. Keep it short, Oath. We don't want him getting a DF fix on us. Roger, Mr. Brill, this is Snowcat 1. I copy. How's it going, Mr. Ronson? Fine, Mr. Brill. A few more miles and our grasses will be running real smooth. Just signal top below S5. Where are you? We'll be following our tracks back to base in about three hours, Mr. Brill. Over and out. He suspects something. Of course he does. Me out with a snowcat a couple of days after he warned me off. Sherwood! Reverse! <laughs> Hang on! Oh. 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 Christ! 
We're jammed. No one move. No one move or breathe or do anything. We tipped down and jammed between the sides of a crevasse. I just didn't see it. There's an almost total whiteout. <laughs> It won't if the roof collapses. Oh, no. Right. That's all that's stopping us. Like being in a vice. Are you okay, Julia? I'm I'm trying to move my leg. It's jammed against the side of the Do it slowly, very, very, very slowly. <sighs> okay. That's better. Anyone like to say a prayer? Say something into the radio. That might be more sensible. Okay. Rosenthal, this is Snowcat 1. Do you copy? Rosenthal Base, this is Glyn Sherwood calling from Snowcat 1. Do you have a copy on me? See if you can pick up the American Speedmore beacon on Channel 5. Damn, strange, eh? Hey? That beacon should be end stop signal strength. Hold on. Hey, you keep on going. Just trying to look through my side window. The roof antenna's broken. Oh, God. I can just see it hanging down. Great. Well, anyone any ideas? Well, outside temperature is minus 30. We have to go out through the roof hatch. If we can get it open. And cramp on a nice big climb up to the edge. I have to get into our ECW suits outside. Cause too much movement in here. Okay, see if you can get the hatch open, Ove. Okay. No one breathe. Okay. She's unlocked. Easy. Easy. Blasted things jammed. Ove. Ove. I say has it shifted? It damn near shifted us a few hundred feet downwards. Oh, no. What? I can just see the edge of the roof. Yeah? There's about a three-inch ledge of ice that's holding us. Oh. Look, I've got an idea. I'm much lighter than you two, especially Oaf. If I go out, oh, I could tie a cord onto the front power winch shackle no and climb up to the ice way. field. The back end of the cat's about level with the brink, so it won't be a difficult climb. No, it's fast. And I could bury a couple of spades in the ice, well away from the brink with the winch cable tied around yeah, them. Yeah, no, it's right. much too dangerous. It's not as dangerous as sitting here waiting for three inches of ice to give way. At least an anchored cable might stop the cat from slipping any further. That ledge is bound to give once you two gorillas start no, moving about. I won't let you do it. Please. She's right, Glenn. There's no way in the world I'm going to let Julia go out there alone. No way in the world! Sherwood! Yeah? I've finished! Okay! I've buried the power winch cable down about a metre! Tied to a couple of ice picks! It'll take an enormous load! Is there any way you can take up the slack in the cable to ease the load on the ice? Maybe use the starter motor to turn the winch. Vibration might be bad. You better leave it! Okay, we're coming on! Oh! She's going! She's going! Stop the engine! It's your only hope! She's awake. Thank God. Julia? Oh. oh, pretty tough kid, eh? You take care of her. I fix the antenna. Okay. Oh, oh. oh what 
happened? Well, just as I started the engine, the ice collapsed. I jammed the power winch into gear and the snowcat pulled herself up the cable like a spider. And just as we got out of the crevasse, both ice picks came out of the ice. One of them shattered and the handle caught you a glancing blow on the head. How do you feel? Like I've been kicked by a horse. Oh, sorry, a brontosaurus. Well, at least there's no permanent damage to your stunning beauty. Oh, shut up. <laughs> you were very lucky. What's the damage to the snowcat? Oh, not too bad. The roof's a bit buckled and the uh, HF antenna's torn off. Oaf's fixing it now. That's about all. So where are we? Well, we're on the coast. But we were 20 miles from the coast. Mm-hmm. Do you mean to say that you're so obsessed with your bloody ice that we pushed onto the coast while I was at death's door? Now, wait, wait a minute. Hang on. We couldn't turn back to Rosenthal. Why not? Well, that's your fault, I'm afraid. You anchored the winch cable on the wrong side of the crevasse. Mm. We drove a couple of miles along the edge, in both directions, looking for an ice bridge. And then we spotted the sea, where there shouldn't be sea. What? Take a look. Here, gently, I'll help you. Oh, it's okay. See? Oh. Coast, where there shouldn't be coast for another 20 miles. So it looks like you were right. Well, I just don't know, Julia. Nothing makes any sense. If there has been a major iceberg carving event, then where are the icebergs? The big ones might have had enough momentum to carry them into deep water, but where are the growlers, the small icebergs? There should be thousands of them aground in the bay. Well, as you can see, there's only a handful. But maybe those satellite pictures were wrong. Maybe you misinterpreted no, them. No, no, no. This bay is new. It's roughly triangular-shaped. Uh, 180 miles across by 90 deep. 8,000 square miles of ice that has simply disappeared. Okay, maybe the radio works now. I've fixed a wire antenna. Great. I think I can make a shrewd guess as to what Angus Brill is going to have to say to us. <laughs> During my five years as director of the Rosenthal Antarctic Survey, I have never known such arrogant insubordination. Oh. The only thing that interests me is fulfilling our United Nations contract, oh, and yes. that involves core sampling the ice cap, not chasing icebergs. For Christ's sake, Brill, we're talking here about a major fracture. We are talking about you three blatantly flouting my orders. Oh, for God's sake. The second thing that interests me is getting you off this base as quickly and as cheaply as possible. What? Sherwood! You have about 300 tons of core samples for dispatch back to the UK, correct? About that, yes. There's a refrigeration meat ship, the Orion, calling at Sydney next month on our way to Southampton. Your core samples will be on board. All right. And so will you three. What? The Orion carries passengers. Hey, now wait a minute. What about our contracts? We've got another six months each to run, and you're supposed to provide our airfares home. Your contract requires you to obey the reasonable orders of the survey's director, Miss Hammond. Oh, that's ridiculous. I've secured a favourable deal with the owners of the Orion. You either return to England on her, or all three of you are under suspension as from this minute. So which is it to be? The ice moved. But the mountains that had been imprisoned in the ice for so long were still locked in its frozen embrace. Torn away by their roots from the Earth's mantle, they were now dragging the ice down beneath the waves, causing it to float in a state of uneasy equilibrium, its base carving a canyon in the abyssal sediment that covered the ocean floor, and its monstrous plateau concealed beneath a shallow upper layer of ocean. Slowly and inexorably, the west wind drift current established supremacy. Unseen, the ice moved northwards. There's a certain poetry in watching the ships wake in the moonlight. Mm. Do you know something? What's that? I can't understand how you've been able to resist me for so long. <laughs> Still, plenty of time yet. We've another 12 days before Southampton. I've never crossed the equator on a ship. Ah, should be quite a party with 30 passengers, six of whom are nuns. Cold? Mm, a bit. Come here. There, yeah, 
matters, eh? Mm. That's something you ought to be grateful to Brill for. A long sea voyage gives you the chance to get to know me better. To learn to call me by my first name, for one thing. And to discover what a truly wonderful person I am. That's odd. What? The sea in the ship's wake. It's mustard colored. You're the marine biologist, sweetheart. I've heard of it happening when Creel dies en masse. I've never seen it, though. Probably an optical illusion. I suppose. Good evening. Oh, oh hello, uh, Oaf. Ah, it's a nice dress. Ooh, a compliment from Oaf. <laughs> I shall treasure it forever. <laughs> anyway, sorry to be unsociable, but I'm off to bed. See you in the morning, folks. Okay. Good night. Good night. Sleep well. You see the color of the sea? Hmm. Julia just commented on it. Ice. What? Ice. I can smell it. Oh, come off it, Oaf. You can't smell ice. All whalers can smell ice. You know when it's there? It does something to the air. You can feel it, smell it, taste it. Oh, we're a day's sailing north of Cape Town, 400 miles or more. There's no way that an iceberg is going to survive long enough to reach this latitude. Maybe. But it's out there. Pretty damn near, too. I didn't wake you. No, I, I couldn't sleep either. For once the turbines were keeping me awake. Oh, I never worried about them before. A coffee? Steward's left me a flask I haven't touched. Why not? There was no thunderous snoring from Oaf's cabin when I came past, so he's not sleeping either. Ah, uh, he's decided to sleep up on deck tonight. Whatever for? Oaf is Norwegian. Is further explanation necessary? Now then, should I? Jammed. Shelma, there's water coming in under the door. Grab the table, help me. That's it. One more. Ah. Oh. Freeze. Just grab onto the rail. Make the air of the There is no cause for alarm. What? All deck crew to the emergency station. All cabin crew to check cabins. Are you talking to a Yeah. What the hell's happening? I don't know, sir. I don't know. Please use the right hand command and way on your way there. I'll be with you when I've checked all the cabins. Do you need help? Oh, she's going First, hold the raft away from the side. What are those lumps in the water? Ice, tiddly growlers everywhere, torn away when the ship ripper brought them out of There can't be ice this far north. Let's get moving before she goes off. I'm lousy at climbing ropes. You walk backward down the side like this. It's easy. Lynn, I can't do it. Sure you can. How are you doing, Oath? No problems. Okay, send Julia down first. Lynn, I'm telling you, if I could, I would, but I can't. Will you climb that crevasse now? Come on. That was in danger. I can't swim! Won't have to swim! Oak will guide you into the raft! Get him! Throw him down! Carry Julia Hooter hold! Ah! I can't fool! I said order! We'll never find her now! Water at these temperatures. Shut up. I'm being realistic. You're being a pain. Over there. Paddle. You paddle like stink. What did you see? Paddle harder, goddamn you. Okay. Stop. Stop. Oh, you help me. Is she? 
Come on. Oh, little one. Mouth open wide so I can breathe into you. Oh, we gotta get the wind off her. Yeah. You get the pole up. Get the cover sit down while I do this. Come on. Okay. She's breathing. Oh, thank God. Thank God. Only used. Doesn't sound like she's got water in the lungs. Lucky. What the hell are you doing? Get, gotta get all the clothes off. What? You pull the tights down. God damn it, you water to live, eh? Just do it! Ah. Oh, the color of her skin! Ah, I've seen worse. Okay. Now we get our clothes off. What? What for? We get all our clothes off. We break open those bags of blankets. We roll ourselves up in them with her in the middle. If we don't get her warm bloody soon, then she dies. Oh, you awake? I'm awake. Her body's still freezing. No, she dies soon. You can't say that, Oaf. Look, her breathing is getting faster. No good if we can't get her warm. I fished dead men out of freezing water been in half the time she was. Oh, God. An iceberg north of Cape Town. It doesn't make any sense, Oaf. If, if, if it was an iceberg, why didn't we see it after the Orion had gone down? You're the expert on ice. I think her heartbeat's getting slower. Listen. Fog. Oh, that's all the search and rescue teams need. That reminds me, there must be a radio beacon of some sort. Oh, yeah. Got it. Now, what does it say? Sarah, search and rescue and homing, extend antenna, float unit in the water, secured to life raft by the lanyard. Operation of the beacon is fully automatic. I wonder what its range is. You shut up and listen. Sounds like breathing. Yeah, coming from over there. Are we paddling? And we don't make any sound. Surely we should be paddling away from that noise. Doesn't sound too friendly. Damn fuck. What was that? Ice. It's right under us. Oh. An eye. Look, we're going back. A blue. Breathing like that, I knew it had to be a blue. What? A whale? Hell's teeth, it's fast. Oh, we gotta get clear if it suddenly sounds. Can't sound. He's beached on the ice, being crushed by its own weight. Pretty near dead already. Soon make sure. Oh, a meter of aluminium paddle handle makes a pretty good harpoon, eh? Now oh, get ready to paddle like stink if it kicks. One flick from his tail, we're finished. What the hell are you planning? Straight through the eye into the brain. <laughs> Pretty damn dead now, eh? Ha! Oh, what the hell do we want with a dead whale? Oh, we've got enough food for 24 men. Now we get to work. Give me the knife. What? Okay. Now what we're gonna do? We're going to cut away a big square of blubber. Then we open a wound in the side of the whale, a big one. Cut an artery so that it fills with blood. Then we put the girl inside the whale. Naked, with just the head sticking out, okay? We're gonna do what? She needs warmth. And the blood of this whale is going to be warm for hours yet. We give her a long soaking in a blood bath. Oof. Her color's coming back and she's breathing better. Ah, she's looking pretty good, eh? Better than she did 30 minutes back. Oof, you're a genius. Ah, uh, thank God she survived. Yes. Hey, helicopter! Great! Do you reckon they've seen us? Bright yellow raft with little radio gizmos corking away. Sure they've seen us. U.S. Navy. Yeah, they're altering course this way. Oh, what's happening? Julia, my dear. Hey, Clinch is awake. Somebody please tell me where I am. That's gonna take a lot of explaining.
Don't stand on ceremony, folks. Uh, uh, just make yourself comfortable. There's yeah, plenty of seats, eh? That's oh. great. Sir? Yes. Glenn Sherwood. How do you How do? do? Olaf Johansson. Yes. And Ms. Julia Hammond. Ms. Hammond. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Admiral Brandon Pearson, acting Sackland. Okay, Captain Hagen. Ah, uh, I'd like you to stay, uh, make a few notes, okay? Uh, yes, sir. I, I just received a reply to my signal today. Can I wait? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, now. How are you all doing? Has Captain Hagen been treating you okay? Couldn't have been better. That's fine. Right. Oh, that's fine. Welcome aboard the Eureka. Thank you. I'm sorry about the long flight, but this research ship has the best hospital facilities in the entire Atlantic exercise fleet. Now, Miss Hammond, uh, I guess you must be feeling a lot better now than when you were unloaded from the helicopter yesterday, huh? <laughs> Thank you. I'm feeling fine now. <laughs> I only hope I smell better, too. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you must have been pretty shaken up when you discovered how these two crazy guys saved your life. Very shaken. Why are you called Sackland, Admiral? Or is that some sort of naval secret? Ah, uh, Supreme Allied Commander Atlantic. Oh. Uh, you needn't look so impressed. They only picked me because they thought my ulcers would stand it. <laughs> uh, Mr. Sherwood, uh, I want to thank you for this very concise report that you dictated to Captain Hagen. Yeah, I think the first step is... uh, As reports go, it's pretty controversial, which is why I've flown out from my flagship to carrier Lyndon Johnson to see you. I have some points I'd like to look over with you, if you've no objection. Go ahead, Admiral. You saw ice in the water just before you abandoned ship? Yes, Admiral, that's right. We're certain the Orion struck a submerged iceberg. Well, more than an iceberg. Originally, it was an 8,000 cubic mile chunk of Antarctica that broke away from the main ice cap. An iceberg five degrees south of the equator, Mr. Sherry? I saw ice, too, and I smell it. Well, according to the Orion's manifest, she was carrying 300 tons of ice in her number one forward refrigeration hole. Yes, but I mean that... that 300 tons of ice in the shape of your core samples, Mr. Sherwood. The, the core... <laughs> now, don't you think it's more likely that that's what you saw floating in the water? Admiral. Number one hold would have been ripped out first in an underwater collision. But we saw chunks of ice, Admiral, not 100 mil diameter core samples. Yeah, ice fuses together. Admiral, that whale that, that saved Julia's life was beached on ice. We could feel it with the end of the life raft's paddle. Yeah, but did you see this ice? <sighs> well, no. Yeah, I'm not a scientist like you, Mr. Sherwood. Maybe you can tell me why this ice of yours was disobeying a fundamental law of physics by not floating. All right. That was something that puzzled me at first. Ah. My theory is that the mountain of mountains buried in the ice cap that were the cause of the original glacial blockage were sheared away when the ice cap fractured. Now they're locked in the ice, weighing it down so that it's in a state of neutral buoyancy. Do you accept that this theory of yours could be wrong? Of course I do. But I don't think it is. Well, I like a man who sticks to his guns. All right, then supposing Glynn is wrong, then what did the Orion collide with? We think she ran smack into 5,000 tons of Soviet Delta II class submarine. No, <coughs> no way. We know there were two operating in the mid-Atlantic. That ship went down like a brick. Bottom ripped right out. I did that, not a submarine. Well, now, just supposing you're right. How big was your iceberg when it was capped? Well, my best guess is about 180 miles by 90 miles. So? How did it get here? Well, my belief is that it was carried on the west wind drift current in the Southern Ocean. It then picked up the Benguela current that flows northwards up the coast of Namibia. Now, by now, it would be being pushed northwest across the Atlantic by the North Equatorial current. Towards the Americas? Yes. Okay, that's all for now. I'll see about fixing you up with transport home. Thank you. I won't be flying back to my flat top until tomorrow, but uh, you'll join me for dinner this evening? That's very sure. gracious. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Watch that step. Yes, yeah. sir. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. My God, I've been asked to swallow some stories in my time, Hagen. <laughs> So what was in the signal? It's from the Naval Space Surveillance Center at Dahlgren, Virginia. In response to the signal I sent them after Sherwood dictated his report, 
And what do they got to say for themselves? Uh, <clears throat> your request information on large icebergs refers. Largest seen photograph by ESA-3 satellite during 1967-68. Berg remained in Weddell Sea, possibly grounded. Mm. First seen during orbit 4699 October 1967. Mm -hmm. Last seen orbit 6408 February 1968. Size 175 kilometers by 111 kilometers. Berg designation giant tabular. Wow. Only a few kilometers smaller than Sherwood's Berg. Hmm. Looks that way, sir. Oh, hell. The ice continued its slow, inexorable migration. It was still weighed down by the mountains that it had held imprisoned for five million years. The seas supporting and surrounding the ice became steadily warmer until it was shedding a hundred million tons of its mass each day. But such a loss, when compared with its stupendous bulk, was a mere nothing. The ice had already celebrated 90 days of freedom by destroying a fine ship. On the 120th day since its birth, it crossed the imaginary line that men called the equator. It moved slowly northwards, an unseen, undetected harbinger of death. Hagen. Mason, sir. Signal from the Johnson. An RAF Charlie 130 on a flight from UK to Ascension has sighted the Vegan. Is that a star or a ship, Tony? It's a UK registered sailboat. Crew of 15 kids on the homeward run of an attempt on a round the world record. She hasn't kept her radio skits for three days. Mm. The RAF circled her for 20 minutes. No one showed on deck and she didn't answer visual or radio signals. Mm. Her last known position, speed and course should be on your screen. Yeah, I've got it. So uh, what are we supposed to do? Because she's coming up astern, Johnson wants us to intercept and report. Yeah, okay, Tony. Uh, you got a course and speed? Yeah, we'll have a visual on her in uh, 4 hours 20 if we had 35 at 15. Okay, let's get to it. Vegan Southampton. No doubt about it. There's got to be at least one person on watch, so why the hell doesn't she acknowledge? Search me, Tony. Admiral Pearson says we can board her. Huh, she's hacking along at 15 knots on a tack that could take her clear across the Atlantic. Did he say how we should stop her? Well, you'll have to be your usual expert self with the scuba boat, Tony. <laughs> oh, uh, let Sherwood and the Norwegian guy, Johansson, be the first aboard, huh? Why is that? Well, if, if that sailboat is out to break records, maybe having us stomp all over her is going to disqualify them. Better a couple of foreigners go in first, huh? I'd never have to climb a rope again. Hey, you both okay, Sherwood? Both? Oh, okay. We're both okay, Tony. Hell forward, a couple of hundred yards astern. Okay. Give a shot on the handheld as soon as you've anything to report. Right. Well, self-steering gear working okay, which is why she holds her course. Yeah. The cockpit's deserted. It's bad seamanship. Oh, good seamanship everywhere. Decks clear. Sheets coiled and cleated. See the repairs to this dodger. That's good seamanship. Let me have a look here. Anyone below? She's a dead ship. You and your Nordic superstitions. I suppose you're going to say you can smell a dead ship. It's a really nice smell, Glim. Sure, I sometimes wonder if it... Oh, God. Yeah. And her. And him. All of them. They're all dead. Hmm. July the 27th. We've all had this silly feeling that home is just around the corner, even if we are still in the South Atlantic. Noon. Wendy says that her... 
something is better. I can't make out her handwriting. It could be... could be tooth? Mm, yeah, I think it is. Do you want me to read all the details? Mm -hmm. well, the girl was such a compulsive gossip. Every word, please, Julia. Right. South Africa's Springbok radio is still very strong here. I wish they'd play more pop. 1400. Only two stars with Peter today. There wasn't time for three. <coughs> 1700. Something really weird. The seas suddenly become the color of mustard. A sort of reddish brown. Everyone's baffled. Graham and Donald said that they'd never seen such a thing before. We've heard of it, Captain Hagen. Mm, so have I. Keep reading. Oh, this is her last entry. July the 28th. The sea's still mustard colored. There's tuna fish everywhere. Hundreds of them all charging about like there's no tomorrow. Really weird behavior. One stunned itself on the hull, a tremendous crash. Roy and Tina gaffed it aboard. Fresh fried fish for dinner tonight. There's a few more sentences, but I can hardly read our handwriting. This is terrible. Two something. Mm -hmm. Food poisoning? Mm -hmm, maybe. Tried getting Graham to work radio, but he's not something something. And the last few words are such a scrawl, I don't think anyone could read them. No, I don't think I can't make them out either. Well, I've had the remains of their meal put in the freezer. We don't have an analyst on board. I'm a marine biologist, Captain. I'd like to use one of your labs to take a look at that tuna fish. No problem. Hmm. Just as I thought. Take a look through the microscope. Hmm. Sort of bell-like microorganisms. What are they? A dinoflagellate. Simodinium breve. A sudden drop in water temperature kills them. That's what makes the sea change color. Ah. It's quite common in the Gulf of Mexico where they cause the so-called red tides. Anyway, they release a mild nerve toxin into the water when they die. Small fish swimming through the discoloration are killed when their nerve axons start firing. Their entire nervous systems are disrupted. Uh, can I have a look? Anyone eating that fish, well, Neural toxins are tasteless. You mean these things turn the sea into a sort of nerve gas when they die? Temporarily, yes. But the tuna's a bloody great fish. And people are even bigger. Take a look at the concentrations of our dinoflagellate. See what I mean, Glenn? Mm. Millions of them in that sample alone. And you think it must have been the iceberg that killed them? No other explanation makes sense. We've got to persuade Admiral Pearson to warn all shipping to stay away from the area the vegan was in when they captured the tuna fish. Oh, well, Pearson won't do anything until Krantz has pronounced his verdict. Krantz? Who's he? Walter J. Krantz, Deputy Vice Commander, International Ice Patrol Headquarters, mm. Governor's Island, New York. He's the world's greatest authority on icebergs. Yeah, I know him from my days with the International Ice Patrol. He's a prickly, self-opinionated pompous bastard, and that's a moderate summing up. Well, he's on his way out here. Admiral Pearson, gentlemen, <laughs> all we at the International Ice Patrol can say at the moment regarding these, uh, these wild reports of Mr. Sherwood's... Wild? ...is that we have read, we have considered... And we are skeptical, very skeptical. By we, I take it you mean you, Walter. I choose my words with great care, Mr. Sherwood. Yes. We would like to ask Mr. Sherwood why the inevitable wave disturbance that the calving of 8,000 cubic miles of ice would cause has not been recorded by the floating instrument packages which Scripps and the British IOS have deployed around Antarctica. Okay, your turn, Sherwood. Well... It certainly caused a massive seismic disturbance when it fractured away from the ice cap, Admiral. Mm -hmm. Now, I never said that it moved quickly. The actual carving may have been fairly slow. <laughs> the bird more than likely rode on a lubricating cushion of meltwater generated by friction, but however slowly it moved, with that sort of mass, it would have had more than enough momentum to carry it over the continental shelf and out into deep water. An iceberg is noisy. The process of melting generates a considerable sonic uproar. I understand that this ship is equipped with some of the most sophisticated passive sonar in the world, Captain Hagen. That's correct, sir. Then the iceberg, if it exists, hmm. shouldn't be too difficult to locate. Well, we've tried listening. Our sonar gear is primarily designed to detect the high-frequency sounds caused by submarines pouring energy into the water. But in this area, 
Thanks to the concentrations of porpoises, dolphins, and other fish, we've got a lousy signal-to-noise ratio to cope with. Uh, maybe if we were within 500 miles of the bird, we'd hear something. Well, it'll be easy enough to locate when it surfaces. And just how's that? Well, when the bird drops the mountains or mountain that's been keeping it in a state of neutral buoyancy. <laughs> this is too ridiculous. Look, Walter, what? The idea of a mountain locked inside an ice. Well, why is that so crazy? <laughs> huh? The Grand Banks of Newfoundland have been formed by Greenland icebergs, continually dumping glacial erratics, rocks and debris as they melt. Is that right, Grant? Well, yes, but none of them dump mountains. Uh, well, Sherwood, do you have any idea where this iceberg might be right now? We have two positive positions. The position that Orion was when she went down, and the vegan's position when she ran into the tuna fish. Now, the time and distance between both positions indicate that the iceberg is moving northwest with the South Equatorial Current. It could be that it's been picked up by the Guinea current swinging towards West Africa, but I don't think so. Admiral, this is the most absurd... Okay, most of okay, fans. so it's absurd, Krantz. Fine. Now let's hear uh, Mr. Sherwood out somehow. I don't think he'll mind if he's proved wrong, so where's the iceberg now, Sherwood? Well, I could be up to a thousand miles out, Admiral, but okay. my guess is that it's approximately halfway between Cape Verde Islands and Puerto Rico. Uh -huh. That's 800 miles west of our present position. But what have we got in the way of satellite hardware that could detect an iceberg? Well, our satellites are designed for thermal wake tracking of submarines, sir. An anomaly such as a submerged iceberg would be best detected with airborne gravimeters. Okay, so that's what we'll do. Are you okay for oil and stores if we delay your return to Gibraltar for a couple of days, Captain? No problem, sir. Fine, fine. I want a conference secure link to the Lyndon Johnson. I'm going to initiate an air search. The ice lay still. Countless billions of tons of its bulk had melted away, so that once again the mountains had triumphed. They had dragged the ice down until it lay still in the abyssal depths. There was no daylight. There never had been daylight at this stupendous depth, and never would be. But there was movement around the ice. The continuous luminescent flurry of grotesque bottom-feeding fish shying away from the sudden increase in the density of the seawater caused by the intense cold. And there were sounds, splintering and groaning noises from deep within the ice. The tensions and forces that had gripped the mountains for five million years were being prized loose by the ocean's tenuous warmth. The moment of freedom for the ice was at hand. Roger, Delta 10, we copy that. Go ahead, Delta 17. Roger, Delta 17. Hold it. Hold it. Hold everything. I don't believe it. What's going on, Captain? Go ahead, Delta 17. I switched the camera on. I'm going in low. You're not going to believe this, but it looks like the sea is turning to blood. The ice moved. It moved with infinite slowness, testing its newfound buoyancy now that it had finally torn itself free of the mountains it had dragged halfway around the world. The ponderous, multi-billion ton mass moved uncertainly in the sluggish bottom current. The ice lifted 100 feet, 500 feet. A small mountain whose jagged escarpments had held it in place in the ice was finally dislodged. It fell slowly into the layer of primeval ooze that carpeted the ocean floor. The ascent of the ice quickened. It gently but irresistibly shouldered aside the billions of tons of seawater of its own displacement. Suddenly the movement of the Colossus became an accelerating, exultant surge of freedom. What? Why, that 
it's about 1,000 square miles. God help us. The surface of the ocean was lifting and changing its red hue to a maddened welter as if the sea was boiling. It continued to heave upwards, swelling into a mighty hump like a gargantuan cancer on the face of the ocean. And then the ice erupted with shocking suddenness into the dawn sunlight. Sparkling crystal cliffs rounded by the erosion of warm water. Crevasses, hills, valleys, a range of glittering peaks, dominated by a huge crystal dagger stabbing towards the sky. There were even rivers of cascading seawater that cut deep ravines into the ice. It was a country, a floating country fashioned from countless billions of tons of ice. It was the largest moving object on the planet. Huge cataracts roared into the broken sea, adding incalculable energies to the encircling tidal wave that raced outwards from the scene of the terrible Renaissance. ships sunk by the tidal wave is four and no one knows how many smaller craft and you still think she's beautiful walter and those poor kids it's evil cramps dear dear little one when you think of the damage it's caused the life it's costs i don't derive any satisfaction at all from saying i told you so quite well here we are folks a radar map of the berg from the last aerial survey mr krantz you are right 30 miles by 20. <laughs> Average thickness, 1.5 miles. I have some experience in assessing the mass of icebergs, Captain. Yeah, well, 1,000 cubic miles. Sure is one hell of an ice cube. My calculations are that it will have completely melted within 15 days. 15 days? More like 50. If you produce some figures, Sherwood, then let's see them. But with the greatest respect, Walter, you're basing your calculations on Greenland birds moving south, correct? Ice is ice, north or south. Yeah, well, this thing's not an iceberg in the true sense of the word. It's a fragment of the Antarctic ice cap. And none of the rules relating to icebergs apply. It's big enough to make up its own rules and break all ours, which it's already done. What rules? Well, for one thing, we're in the subtropics. It's calm and can remain so for days at a time. There's not the high wind factor here that we have in Baffin Bay. Now, that means the berg is moving at the same speed as the current. It's as one with the current, if you like. And therefore, the insulating cushion of cold meltwater is completely surrounding it. How about the sound? Surely that's going to speed up the melt rate? Uh, not significantly. Look, ice is a very efficient solar energy reflector. The only way the sun can make a serious impact would be if we were to cover the entire iceberg in black polythene, 600 square miles of it. Mm, I agree there. Well, at least you two can agree on something. We're making progress. So it's the iceberg. What was yesterday's drift distance? 48 miles northwest. If you're right, Sherwood, and it keeps that up, we're going to have one hell of a problem on our hands. Admiral Pearson to see you, Mr. President. Good. Send him in, will you? Mr. President, uh, good morning, sir. Good morning, Brandon. Grab a chair. Thank you, sir. Where's that damned iceberg right now? Well, it's off the coast of Florida, Mr. President, approximately uh, 300 miles due east of Jacksonville. You know the president dubbed it the White Atlantis? Yes, sir. White Atlantis, the great geological miracle. Coming soon at a beach near you, the eighth wonder of the New World. There's even a piece in this paper by a mountaineer on the best route to the Central Peak. Well, technically, we don't have a legal responsibility to stop people who want to break their necks by climbing White Atlantis. Uh, it's in international waters. It's not even over our continental shelf. What concerns me is if it gets into New York Bay and breaks up, then we'll be dealing with thousands of icebergs. Suspension of tanker and freighter movements in and out of the eastern seaboard ports will cause irreparable damage to trade and the nation's economy. And any extension of the ban on deep-sea fishing is going to cost us several billion dollars. Well, sir, we have a rough forecast. About the only thing Krantz and Sherwood have managed to agree on is that the iceberg will eventually be picked up by the Gulf Stream and pushed northwest. And that it will eventually disintegrate uh, in the mid-Atlantic between 40 and 50 degrees west. It'll miss New York Bay? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, the, the prevailing wind is holding it about uh, 400 miles off the Delaware coast. Mm -hmm. So how big is White Atlantis now? Well, 5,000 million tons. Uh, 
about the size of Long Island. Go ahead. An urgent call for Admiral Pearson from the captain of the Eureka, Mr. President. Oh, that'll be Captain Hagen. Okay. Hook him through. Go ahead, Brandon. Hagen? This had better be good. It's not good, sir. White Atlantis has altered course. She started swinging northeast an hour ago. Oh, hell. The wind hasn't changed. We've contacted the Scripps Institute. There's a northeast subsurface current that's stronger than the surface what? current. How does this affect our forecast? Sherwin and Krantz say that we don't have a forecast. Not now. Oh, okay. Clear for now. Uh, I'll come back to you in about 30 minutes. Yes, sir. We go ahead, Brandon. A clean one megaton device buried deep in the iceberg. We'll miss all the excitement. I told you, it's a bloody stupid scheme. It'll never work. Well, couldn't we stay until afterwards, Captain Hagen? We may be able to help. Sorry, Julia. Admiral Pearson's orders. Only essential personnel in the area during the test. Uh, you'll be able to watch it on TV in a swank New York hotel. All expenses paid, plus your plane fares home. We're very grateful for everything that you, Glenn, and Wolf have done. TV camera crews are essential personnel, I suppose. <laughs> uh, by American standards, they are. <laughs> oh, well, maybe it's not such a bad idea after all, Julia. I can see it now. Dim lights, the television flickering in the corner, you and me on the sofa. Stop it, Glenn. I think I should miss New York. Fly straight back to Norway. A helicopter will take you straight to JFK, no problem. Oh, you can't go back right away. Why not, my little one? Well, we need you. You you saved my life. And you saved mine and Glint's. Without you, I would never have lived to see my home again. You have given me back its mountains and its forests. Oh, please. Captain Hagen, I've uh, thought of a way that Julia and I could save the American taxpayer some money while we're in New York. What's that? We could uh, share a hotel room. Goodbye, Julia. We are now going live to Steve Harris in the White Atlantis area. Here we go. As you can see, White Atlantis is a fantastic sight from amazing. here. Uh, it's it's shining on the water like a priceless diamond. Yeah, it'll be like Prince's point of view. Yeah, it'll be like using a fire to blow up my drivers. Do you watch? Minute. Countdown to the Big Bang started an hour ago when a Navy chopper ferried away the Seabees who have embedded the one megaton atomic bomb <laughs> 500 feet deep in the ice. Admiral Pearson, who is in charge of the destruction oh, of White Atlantis, has compared this operation with the blowing up of Hemigoland in 1921. Nation minus five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Oh, please, Nuclear fusion me. initiated. Uh, nothing seems to be happening. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 you can see it blurring around the remote control tower. Now, that has got to be the shockwave. Yeah, you can actually see it. Oh, my God, just look at that. Mm. Now, that is not supposed to happen. <laughs> Hole that size must we'll be have going done straight something. back to White Atlantis <sighs> for an update right after these messages. You see, the ice that blasted out doesn't amount to more when than you're a, home for losing the a day anyway. With that so what will they do now? The There's nothing they can do. You need a White Atlantis will go aground on the continental one. shelf of New York Bay and start the breaking up. And it'll cause no end of shipping chaos room. for a few weeks. When you need a freezer, anyway, it's no longer our problem. Come on, I promised to show you my old apartment on 10th Avenue. Oh, we've only got a few hours left. I'd much rather go up the Empire State Building. Hmm. It's not the tallest building in the world anymore, you know. I don't care. I can't go home without seeing New York from the top of it. 
Well, all right. Empire State it is. And why don't you put some clothes on? You look a bit silly like that. That's the World Trade Center. Over there on the Hudson is where the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth used to dock. And that's where we were yesterday, Central Park. How high are we? About a quarter of a mile. If you really think I'm unattractive, why did you go to bed with me? Why is it that Manhattan can have such high buildings? Why not London? You see those massive outcrops of black rock in Central Park? Why did you? I don't know. It's just that you were so relentless. I couldn't believe it the way you butted in when Oaf was trying to... It's called Manhattan Schist. Manhattan what? Schist. I see. It's a high-density metamorphic rock that goes down several hundred feet. It's the finest building platform any engineer could ask for, although they curse it when they have to tunnel. When I first came... Oh, no. What's the matter? God, why didn't I think? Think what? What is it? Come on, we've got to go. Where? Gracie Mansion. What's Gracie Mansion? It's the mayor of New York's office. Come on. Take it easy, Mr. Sherwood. We know all about it. We've received regular updates from Admiral Pearson. The Admiral last Pearson. one was five minutes back. White Atlantis has a mass of 400,000 million tons, and it's moving towards the continental shelf in New York Bay at a speed of 1.6 knots. Yes, but what It's you going to go aground in 11 days, and it's going to give us a major headache when it breaks up, right? It's not as simple as that, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> what do you mean? It's this question of the huge mass that White Atlantis has and the colossal amount of kinetic energy that's stored in that mass. Now, most of New York consists of metamorphic rock. Yeah, so? Well, all metamorphics, quartz and so on, are hard and dense. Manhattan schist is one of the hardest, and it extends right out under the glacial drift and Hudson silt to the edge of the continental shelf. Huh. What's uh, glacial drift? Debris that was brought down during the last ice age. It's yeah. a mass of gravel, boulder clay and other erratics that covers Manhattan to a depth of about 90 feet. Now, it might help absorb some of the shock waves, but I doubt it. What shock waves? High density strata conduct seismic shock waves over long distances with very little loss of energy. If White Atlantis holds its present course and speed, it'll strike the continental shelf 11 days from now and release more seismic energy than the San Andreas Fault slipping 10 meters. The entire city of New York will ring like a bell. Well, Mr. Sherwood, I've checked it out with the National Center of Earthquake Research at Menlo Park. The hell of it is, Admiral, they back him up. I see. It gives me no satisfaction, Admiral Pearson. It seems they talk about ground acceleration of one meter per second when the ice strikes. A severe earthquake, they say. And don't forget the tidal wave. <laughs> Can't anyone stop the goddamn thing? Mayor, our only hope is that the subsurface current that's pushing White Atlantis towards New York will be deflected by the Continental Shelf. But even if it is, it's the sheer momentum of the iceberg that's the problem. That's right. And we know next to nothing about subsurface currents. Well, you've got to come up with something. Otherwise, God only knows how, we're going to have to evacuate New York. Well, when I lived here, Manhattan seemed to evacuate itself every evening between four and six. What kind of a stupid remark is that? I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. I tell you something, Mr. Sherwood. Manhattan covers 21 square miles and has a population of around 2 million. Brooklyn is double with the size of a population of 3 million. Yes. The Bronx, 41 square miles, another 2 million. And then there's Queens. You know how big Queens is? No, 118 square miles and 3 million. Take the whole area and you've got 12 million people. 12 million? People, Mr. Sherwood. People with homes, backyards, families, businesses, roots. And we're going to have to move them. 5% of the population of the entire United States. Glynn. Yeah? That radio is keeping me awake. <sighs> Sorry. It's okay for you. It's damned uncomfortable on this sofa. I see. You can't sleep, so nobody else is allowed to. Oh, I need a drink. Do you want something? Yeah, if you like. <sighs> Anything except a Manhattan cocktail. Um, yes, please. Wasn't there 
Arab scheme to tow icebergs to the Middle East as a source of fresh water. Couldn't White Atlantis be stopped if there were enough ships? <laughs> it's already been thought of. That's where Krantz is now, busy with the IIP computer. <clears throat> the collective power of the whole world's merchant fleet doesn't begin to add up to the power needed to stop White Atlantis. I once read a book on karate. You know the sort of thing. How to take advantage of your opponent's superior weight when he's pushing against you and you're shoving back. You suddenly change your push to a pull and down he goes. Uh, a one megaton karate chop didn't seem to make much of an impression. I'm not saying you could stop it, but couldn't it be deflected? You know something? You're not only beautiful, you're brilliant. I flew over it in the helicopter, Brandon. I couldn't help thinking what an awe-inspiring creation it is. Can we take the Eureka in closer? Uh, no, this is about as close as we dare to go, Mr. President. Those, uh, those cliffs there are continuously crumbling. How many of those pile-driving teams are at work on the Berg? Ah, uh, there's over 4,000 CB personnel on White Atlantis right now, sir. They estimate that uh, they'll have the 200 steel girder anchorage points driven into the ice within 72 hours. Mm. Nine days to go. Mm -hmm. What do you reckon our chances are of beating this thing, Brandon? Oh, maybe a little better than zero if we do nothing, Mr. President. Even if we do beat it, it we're still going to be stuck with the problem of several hundred cubic miles of ice breaking up in New York Bay. Uh -huh. The disruption of shipping, fishing. Have you any contingency plans for that? Uh, no, sir. What was the name of the English scientist who blew the whistle on this? Sherwood? Uh, that's correct, sir. Does he have any ideas? Uh, I haven't asked him. Maybe it would be a good idea if you did. Yes, sir. Okay, Brandon. I'll order every U.S. registered ship over 10,000 tons to New York that can get here within seven days. Uh, we'll need 200 serviceable ships, sir. That means getting at least 300 ships to check out. Uh, sir, are you going ahead with the evacuation of New York? I've got a meeting with Governor Dellen and Senator Walker as soon as I get back to Washington. It'll have to go ahead, Brandon. There's too many lives at stake. Oh, this is a fantastic sight. It must be the largest gathering of ships since uh, D-Day. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Uh, no one else has ever seen anything like it before. Uh, from a thousand feet, it looks as if New York Bay has become one giant parking lot for every merchant ship and warship in the West. A number of British ships have joined in. The ship in the center of the picture is the Eureka, the floating headquarters of Admiral Brandon Pearson. The Eureka is the control center for this fantastic operation. And on the horizon, if we bring the camera up, maybe it doesn't show on your screens. Yeah, that's the pale ethereal light of white Atlantis flickering against the sky. The iceberg is 170 miles away over the horizon. 20 miles long, 12 miles wide, 300 cubic miles of cold, solid ice heading this way. Now, I'm going to try now to speak to Admiral Pearson. Uh, Admiral Pearson, can you tell everyone how the operation's doing? Well, uh, the first stage is finished. Uh, that was the construction of a 10-mile-wide frontier of 500 anchorage points driven into the far side of uh, White Atlantis. Tonight, the sea bees will start attaching the main hawsers. These will be supported out to sea on floating pontoons so that they can be picked up by the towing ships. The number of tow lines assigned to each ship depends on its power and size. The, uh, the Enterprise, for example, will have about 20 tow lines. Say tow lines, but you won't be towing White Atlantis. Well, that's correct. Uh, nor will we be trying to stop it. The fleet will provide an anchorage point for White Atlantis to swing around slightly. Uh, we're aiming to achieve a course deflection of uh, three degrees. And if we succeed, White Atlantis will converge on the continental shelf at a shallow angle so that we may have an impact of around a tenth of a knot instead of upwards of two knots. Once the White Atlantis is safely wedged on the continental shelf, all the ships will slip their tow lines. Will it work, Admiral? Well, it's got to work. Eureka to tow ship 31. You are okay. Pick up your tow. Hello, Sherwood. Miss Hammond. 
Welcome back aboard the Eureka. Well, thanks for asking us back, Admiral. Ah, I figured you had a right to see what's going on. That's not what you said last time, Admiral. Uh-huh. Computer prediction, ice strike minus 39 hours, 20 minutes, course deflection zero. Looks like you've been busy, Admiral. Well, Captain Hagen and his men have. They fixed up this control room in only 24 hours. All very professional. Well, now all we have to do is pray that the weather's going to hold. We haven't had time to even look at television. So how's everything doing in New York? Well, they're still evacuating Queens. Oh. Manhattan's a ghost town. Even the police car that took us to the heliport had trouble getting through the checkpoints. What are the ships doing at this moment? Well, uh, there's still a few waiting to pick up their tow lines. Uh, you see, they have to go in strict order. Controlling 200 ships in a few square nautical miles of ocean isn't easy. And we still haven't cracked the problem of what to do about the iceberg when it breaks up. All tow ships will be in position in two hours, sir. Tow ship 191, all lines secured. Did I ever tell you that we've got a swimming pool at home? Okay, I copy. Final reports from tow ships 190 through 200. If you are bragging about your upper middle class... During hard winters, there was always the danger of water freezing in the filter and pump. So when it was freezing cold, Dad always used to run the pump. He said running water didn't freeze. Yeah, well, he was wrong. Look, what's this guy doing? Of course he was wrong. Attention, please, attention. All tow ships in position, all tow lines secure. He didn't realize... Okay, Captain Hagen. Notify all tow ships to stand by for 20% power... In five nine, minutes. Nine. All lines secured. Blimey, Chief. 20 odd hours at maximum revs. This old rust bucket? Aye, uh, that's what the heck all that it. These ancient old oil guzzlers blow up after two hours. Well, that's what I told the captain. Uh, half a head on board they want. It looks like the fun's about to start. Blimey. All ships have reported, Admiral. We've been running at 20% power for three hours. Very good. All the anchorage points on White Atlantis are holding. A tow ship 32 has got a shaft bearing running hot. What? They're working on it now. Well, tell them to cut and run. I say it's not serious. Well, I don't give a damn. I don't want any ships breaking down when we're towing under full power. Now tell them to cut and run right now. And then we go to 50%. And there they are. Uh, there's the first group of 20 ships just coming into your picture. Uh, you can see their tow lines. Each one of those cables is as thick as a man's leg, and yet, compared with these stupendous mass of white Atlantis, they could be cotton threads. The ships are pulling at 50% power now. Uh, they're going to hold that for another 10 hours just to make sure that everything is okay. The real test comes at first light tomorrow when Admiral Pearson will give the order for all ships to give it all they've got. Glynn, uh, wake up. Uh, what? Glynn. <sighs> you have to wake me. You weren't so keen in New York. I want to talk. Meaning that I'm not allowed to sleep, hmm? Why do you think Dad's swimming pool plant room doesn't freeze up in winter when the pump's running? <sighs> I don't believe this. If the pump's not running, then the amount of water in the pump and filter isn't more than a few litres. And being only a few litres means that it doesn't contain much heat and therefore can freeze up easily, right? Mm, right. But switching the pump on creates a larger system that includes all the water in the pool, which contains a huge amount of heat, even though the temperature might be quite low. In other words, the water passing through the filter and pump is constantly replaced <laughs> before it has a chance to give up its heat and freeze. Are you listening, Glyn? Mm, I'm hanging on to every word. Remember when I mixed your drink in the hotel room? I couldn't get the ice cubes out of their tray. I held them under a cold running tap and they dropped out immediately, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those ice cubes were still floating around in the bowl an hour later. And yet an ice cube which I held under the tap disappeared almost immediately. It's easy to see why. The ice cubes in the bowl were sitting in cold water of their own making, which slowed up their melt rate, whereas the water streaming out of the tap was being constantly replaced. The tap water was cold enough but it was warm in comparison with the ice cube. What well, do you see what I'm driving at? Julia? Yes? 
I think you've got something. Computer prediction, ice strike minus 19 hours 30. Course deflection zero. Okay, Captain Hagen, uh, tell him to stand by. All acknowledge. Attention all ships, this is Eureka. We're going to give the order for full power in one minute. Any commanders have any doubts? Now is your chance to say so. Let's get on with it. Eureka to all ships. Any commanders anticipating mechanical problems, say so now. Let's get to it, fellas. Okay. Good luck, you guys. Full power on the count of zero. Okay, one, nine, four. Pal Jerry, we seem to be having some trouble with our engines. Do you have heating yet? Them engines don't sound so happy, do they, Chief? Would you seem happy after working flat out for five hours? Can you hear the tappets? Hey, much more of this and we'll be seeing them next. A staggering sight. Two hundred ships. Their mighty screws pulverizing the water to a maddened white foam as they, as they pour millions of horsepower into the heaving ocean and throw themselves into the teeth of a strengthening wind in their desperate attempt to uh, deflect White Atlantis' titanic bulk from a course that could cause untold damage to New York. Now, for ten hours now, these iron lithians have been hurling their combined masses against their horses. For ten hours, men have sweated in engine rooms or waited on bridges, all praying for the word from Eureka that they are winning their unremitting struggle. But the Eureka remains silent, save for the endless weather reports and exhortations to the battling ships. And while the Eureka stays silent, so the engines of the 200 ships pound on. And we remain on watch to bring you the latest happenings as they happen. INS computers are showing a course deflection. What the hell they are? Course deflection. Look at that board. 33 minutes of arc Davis. east. All right. 40 minutes. 45. We're doing it, sir. Okay, okay. Now let's just see if we can maintain that deflection before we start throwing our hats in the air. That's a new noise, Chief. You better get clear, laddie. Get clear. Get clear. The fourth course. Ship 127, Pal Joey, this is Eureka. Fire your explosive bolts, drop your hawser now, and auxiliary will tow you clear. Admiral, that's the third ship that's had to drop out. <sighs> How long now to ice strike? Computer prediction is ice strike minus six hours twenty. Course deflection. It... That can't be right. What? It is right. Our course deflection is back to half a degree, sir. Oh, goddamn wind! Well, there's no point in those ships busting their guts in this wind, sir. Sir? Uh, issue a general order. Uh, all ships to 25% power. It's all over. Uh, although there's been no official word from Eureka that the battle is lost, the sight of those wallowing ships on your screens and that we're now 30 minutes from ice strike must tell the sad story for us. Well, at least we tried. At least we fought. If we have lost, it is because, despite all our achievements, mankind's powers are still puny when compared to the awesome, overwhelming forces of Mother Nature. Damn, damn, damn. Swearing at the bulkhead isn't going to solve anything, Glenn. Three degree course deflection, that's all we needed. Three lousy degrees. A bloody wind has to go and start blowing an ear gale. Sherwood, yes? I'll be there in 30 seconds. Do you believe it? The wind's veering round. And I've just given the order to resume the tow at 100% power. The wind veering 100 degrees in a few minutes, is that usual? Uh, it can happen in New York Bay, yes. And it can veer back again. It sure can. I strike minus two zero minutes. White Atlantis is 1,000 yards from the continental shelf. Oh, dear God, look kindly on us in our efforts this day. Course deflection one degree. One degree ten. Twenty. It's working. 
It's 10 minutes to the ice strike. White Atlantis is 500 yards from the continental shelf. As you can see, the 200 ships are thrashing the water as wide as the great iceberg itself in their attempts to deflect it from its course. And they're succeeding. We've just heard from Captain Hagen on the Eureka that they have a two-degree course deflection. Nine minutes to ice strike, and maybe, just maybe, they're winning. Uh -huh, there's the computer confirmation. White Atlantis is now virtually parallel to the Continental Shelf. Ice strike minus three minutes. Course deflection, two degrees, thirty. I've had an idea for disposing of White Atlantis once she's gone aground. Uh, the hell you have. We'll uh, talk about it later. One minute to ice strike. And even from here, you can feel the unbearable tension reaching out from the Eureka and the 200 battling ships. Fifty seconds. The ships are giving it everything they've got, and much more. The debt in New York will owe those men, and their ships, if they succeed, will be incalculable. Ice strike, minus 30 seconds. Oh dear God, please. 20 seconds. Approach velocity, 9 meters per second. It's too damn fast. 10 seconds. <sighs> Approach velocity, 6 meters per second. It's better, better. 5, 4, 3, 2... One. I think we've done it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have ice strike at a velocity of four <laughs> meters per second. You're eager to all tow ships. Fire your explosive. <laughs> After a week of using high-pressure fire hoses from their firefighting ships, the fire department have virtually finished their task of slicing up the grounded bulk of White Atlantis. Of the once massive bulk of the largest object ever to move on the surface of our planet, all that remains now are a few small icebergs which are being allowed to drift away into nothingness. The party, which Admiral Pearson is giving on the Eureka this evening, marks the official end of the White Atlantis War. <laughs> Lynn, there you are. Hi. I've been looking for you. Americans certainly know how to throw a party. This place is I suppose it was your idea to use yeah. ice from White Atlantis for the drinks, hmm? <laughs> Yes. You all right? Yes. Well, no, not really. Look, Glyn, I, um... Ah, uh, Miss Hammond, you, uh, uh, Mr. Sherwood, uh, do you have a moment? I would like to present you to the President of the United States. Oh. How, do you do? How do you do? It's an honor to meet you two. America's in your debt. Oh, it's nothing. Please. Brandon, we could use these two guys. Offer them jobs. Aye, aye, sir. <laughs> That's very kind of you, sir. Oh, no, it's not really necessary. Good. Great to have you aboard. Now, if you'll excuse me, I see old McGuire's going a bit heavy on the scotch. <laughs> Gotta make sure you leave some for everybody else. Come on. Yes, yes sir. Glyn, I must say this before anybody else interrupts. I feel really bad about the way things worked out between us. Well, it's just that so much has happened since we've known each other. Everything seems so unreal. And then when we finally got to New York, we were so alone. And I know. Swing together in a strange city, eh? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. It was my fault, really. I knew it wouldn't work. I just couldn't let it go somehow. I'm sorry. <laughs> Me too. Any idea what you're going to do next? Any plans? Well, I don't know. The president's offer's very tempting. Americans pay good money. Don't you want to go home? No. No, there's nothing to keep me there now. What about you? No. I don't think I'll go home either. Why don't you stay on here? I was, um... I was thinking about going to Norway. The Antarctic continent was slowly lifting. It was freed of the great weight it had borne for five million years. It was a gradual movement, 
but a movement possessing the energies of the winters of 50,000 centuries. Cracks appeared in the ice cap. They suddenly widened with a mighty roar that seemed to fill the universe. The opening fissures became canyons, 